you can see my screen. Uh, we have a very interesting topic lined up for you, unpacking uh, the National so Social Security Fund, NSSF Act 2013. And we also have uh, some subtopics there, understanding the 2013 NSSF Act and its implications, uh, benefits of opting out of Tier 2, and how to remit funds to a contracted scheme. Our speaker for today's webinar would be Mr. Simon Ofubwa. Uh, he's the Managing Director at N Wealth Financial Services Limited, and will be taking us through uh, this topic that we have for you. Then uh, immediately after these introductions, we will go into uh, the opening remarks and introduction of the speaker. Uh, this will be done by uh, Ms. Mildred Matibe, Head of Branches and Kimsom, on behalf of uh, the Executive Director, Dr. Murid Indegwa, who was supposed to be with us, uh, but unfortunately has uh, will, will, has, has been unable to, to join us in this webinar. So uh, after that, we will get the keynote address by Mr. Wafubwa, uh, MD at Annual Financial Services. And after that, we go uh, straight into the question and answer session. As is the norm, members, uh, please feel free to type in your questions into the chat box, and uh, the speaker will respond to these questions uh, when we have the Q&A segment. After the Q&A, uh, we will go straight to the closing remarks. And uh, this will be done by Ms. Mildred Matibe. At this point, allow me to welcome Ms. Mildred Matibe, Head of Branches and the uh, Kim School of Management to give us uh, the opening remarks. Uh, Karibu Mildred. Good afternoon. And uh, thank you very much, Brian. Uh, for welcoming uh, me for, to this uh, webinar. Thank you very much, members, and good afternoon. And uh, I'm very pleased to see you uh, join us for this webinar. And um, I know we are all ready to hear uh, what we have for you today. Once again, apologies, uh, we've delayed. That is unlike us. But uh, once in a while, something do happen, but we hope uh, the exciting presentation for today will make up uh, for that. And um, before I give our introduction, uh, give the opportunity to the speaker for today, I wish to first of all give a very brief overview on what we are talking about. That is unpacking the National Social Security Fund Act 2013. I know there's been a lot of buzz in the media about uh, increment and all that, and everybody is eager to hear, how is it going to impact me? How is it going to impact my life? All of us are also keen about uh, financial security. And financial security is important, not just now, but also when we retire or in future how will my financial security be? We all want a desirable financial security where we feel secure. NSSF is one vehicle that is uh, used and we, we shall be eager today to hear how is that, uh, how does that happen? We also look forward to understanding the implication. What are the benefits of tier two? First of all, what is tier two? What are the benefits of opting out, opting in, and so on and so forth? And how do we remit funds? So our topic today touches, I'm sure, all of us at the core. And before we actually delve into unpacking the NSSF Act, all we'll also need to understand the type of retirement plans and pension schemes that we have. From uh, our view, we all want to have a pension scheme. Yeah, and what, what are the main reasons that we need to have pension schemes? And we are looking at three things that we think uh, are important. One, upon retirement, upon retirement, if we look at it generally or how we only understand it, uh, we all know at retirement, there will be a sense of, uh, or there will be reduced income generally when we look at it from uh, the normal uh, definition. When we leave our formal employment, 
Now, when you leave your formal employment, you will not have the income stream that you're so used to. So with a reduction in income at retirement, how then do you cushion yourself? Yeah, and ensure you have a continuous supply of income. Secondly, why do we need to have a pension scheme? Uh, there are those who already have ongoing businesses and I'm sure everyone is thinking or for such kind of persons, they're thinking when we do, when we do retire, then we will have a lump sum amount to implement or to invest in so that our business can grow further and this will become the retirement plan. So there is that group that also desire that. However, if you're looking to start a business from scratch at retirement, from common uh, analysis and research, it has been noted that this is a very risky venture. Yes, there are some who succeed, but it is usually highly risky. And thirdly, would also be keen to have pension scheme because all looking for financial security, just as I had said from the beginning. So the funds of a pension scheme offer protection for dependents. Maybe we have, uh, maybe you are the sole breadwinner or you're partnering in being a sole uh, a bread provider. Then you want to know when you, uh, when you are in case of a demise, are the dependents catered for? So pension schemes also cater for dependents. And uh, this is just but a few of the reasons why uh, pension scheme retirement plans are very important. Now that said and done, there's no doubt that um, the need for a pension scheme, uh, once you have it, what is the next question? Which is the best pension scheme in the market? The SSF we ha is usually uh, a Kenyan, let me say, it is uh, what the government has provided for its citizen. Is it the only one uh, in terms of public or is it the only one available to you? There are many other, but today we are focusing on SSF. And um, of course it is governed by the act of uh, parliament. And uh, the main key is to provide, to uh, to, to provide for contributions and the payment of benefits out of the funds. And uh, it's what we are looking to hear today. So I would request members that uh, let's, uh, let's engage while we are listening to this. And today, our speaker, Mr. Simon Wafubwa, will be taking us on an in-depth journey to understanding the NSSF Act of 2013. Uh, so let's prepare all manner of questions. Let's listen keenly. And uh, before I invite him, I wish to remind all of us, as KIM, there are many other activities we have running. For example, we have the membership. So if uh, you have not renewed your membership, or if you're not a member, a member of KIM, you are invited to join. Details will be provided. The KM School of Management also has a very uh, attractive diploma and certification programs. You're also invited to register. Currently, we are enrolling for the April intake. So you are invited to enroll. We also have the Company of the Year and SME of the Year Awards, where we are inviting companies to start uh, registering for the same. That notwithstanding, we also have a, a very rich training calendar, which you can access on our website. As we shall be going on, details will be shared with you on the, on the chat, but all this information is also available on our website. So you may visit our website at www.kim.ac.ke. So with that, at this point, let me introduce our speaker for the day. So Brian, if we can have the, the bio for the speaker.
Right. So our speaker today, Mr. Simon Wafugwa, is the managing director, M Wealth Financial Services Limited. He is the founder and CEO of that organization. And uh, he started it with just about 300,000. And now the company boasts of an asset base of 85 billion and the administration within 12 years. So congratulations, uh, Mr. Wafugwa, that is quite a feat. I think one day we will invite you to take us through how do we grow our, our, entrepre our entrepreneurial bag. With a team of over 50 employees spread in Kenya, this company, uh, sorry, this company has 50 employees spread in Kenya, Uganda, and Mauritius. It is also positioned, it has positioned its customer value proposition to achieve a lifetime of financial well-being and dignity for its customers through innovation and technology-driven services. As I said, congratulations, Mr. Fubo. I think this is a very, a very uh, good fit. Mr. Fubo holds an MBA in business management and Bachelor of Science in Mathematics, Actual Mathematics Option, both of these degrees from the University of Nairobi. He's an alumnus of Stanford Seed Entrepreneurship Program. He has a cumulative experience of over 20 years in the pension industry, having worked in various firms within the country and regionally in countries such as Nigeria, Tanzania, and Uganda. Mr. Ofubo is also a member of the Pension Management Institute of the UK. He has been a council member of the Association of Retirement Benefit Schemes and a part-time lecturer. Uh, in pension trustee certification at the College of Insurance. So we are in good hands, members. So at this point, I welcome Mr. Wafubwa to take the floor. And um, we are really, uh, we are really actually uh, blessed to have you here. Karibu san. Thank you so much, Madam Milkrek. I'm just setting up my camera. I hope you can see me. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, members, uh, a warm welcome to this webinar, uh, which already have been briefed to the leadership of team. I thank you so much for the opportunity to share this information with the members of the Institute of Management. Without much ado, Allow me just to go straight into the presentation. Um, and uh, in wealth, our vision is a lifetime of financial well being and dignity. You can see the values, trust, excellence, fun at work, and innovation. Details have already been shared. I do not want to give belabor this, uh, but just to give you the context in which pension schemes operate. Um, is that uh, pension schemes, you have a custodian, you have a fund manager, you have the board of trustees, and pension schemes are registered with the Retirement Benefits Authority, and each service provider has a role which is provided within the uh, regulatory framework. So our mandate as pension fund administrators is to ensure compliance, record keeping, and monitoring the investments through the investment accounting arm that we have. And, and so that's basically what we do and ensuring members are paid on time when they leave as guided by the law. However, that's not the case in terms of our focus today. I'm looking more into the NSSF Act. And so here I give you the, a little bit of just the history on the NSSF. Um, in that in this particular act that we are looking at uh, was signed into law on 24th of December 2013. Uh, so it was anticipated that by 10th of January 2014, the act was to commence operations. 
However, um, there was a court order that state implementation of the NSSF Act 2013 uh, in, in June 20, on 25th of June 2014. And so um, recently, the court of a bill reversed the decision of the employment and labor relations paving way uh, for the implementation of the NSSF Act 2013. So following its implementation, uh, following the court order, the implementation of the act then took effect, uh, guided by NSSF, uh, 1st of February, 2023. It's expected that contributions are to be remitted on 9th of every month, and they are based on 6% employer-employer, with a capping of the upper limit in year one being 2,160 shillings. <laughs> I'm going to give you the breakdown in the subsequent slides. So uh, before I get there, let me also just give a little bit of history on the NSSF itself. That um, way back in 1976 to 1977, um, the contributions were at 40 shillings employee, 40 shillings employer, uh, giving a total of 80 shillings. Then from 1977 to 2001, the contribution rates were at um, 160 shillings. They were 10% of the salary, but capped to 80 shillings employee and then 80 shillings employer per month. From 2001, those rates again were re revised to 200 shillings employee employer, giving a total of 400 shillings per month. Now, when you check the accumulation of those contributions in NSF plus investment income, most people get like a total of around just 300 shillings, 300,000 shillings at retirement, between 200 to 300. And so giving uh, what we call uh, an income replacement ratio of just about one to 4%. What we mean by income replacement ratio is um, a measure of income adequacy at retirement to replace your salary in the journey of your retirement. So if you retire at age 60 and you have a lump sum saving of say estimate of 10 million, the way you work out your monthly pension is you take 1% of your lump sum at retirement. That gets estimate to be your monthly pension for life. So if you have say 10 million, 1% of 10 million, that's about 100,000 per month, that gets to be a monthly pension for life. So let's take a case where your salary at retirement was um, maybe 200,000 at retirement at age 60. If you go by income replacement ratio of 1%, <laughs> which means then people end up getting a monthly pension of 2,000 per month, uh, but desired the ideal monthly pension should be not less than 70% of your final salary at retirement. So if your salary at retirement is say 100,000, it's expected that you should at least get monthly pension of around 70,000 per month for life. It's in this regard that uh, government has seen the necessity to review the rates uh, from now 10% to 12 of the earnings, uh, which is basically a split between employee 6%, employer 6%, but is capped to graduated earnings, which I'm going to explain shortly. What is then the difference between the old pension program, NSSF, and the new? The old one was provident. In the provident structure, you get lump sum. Uh, if you get to retirement, you if you have saved, say, 300,000, instead of getting it as a monthly, you get it as a lump sum for life. However, in the new structure, your savings that you had already contributed to be retained in what you call the provident, and the new contributions will be put into a separate account whose accumulation will result to access by way of monthly pension. In the old one, it was mandatory for employed, for employed people 
but it wasn't mandatory for self-employed. In the new one, membership is mandatory for tier one and tier two. Uh, for any employer who has at least one or more employees. By way of contribution rates, before we were doing 200 shilling employee employer, and currently now in the new one, it's expected to do 6% employee of your pensionable earnings and 6% employer, giving you a total of 12%. In the old one, employer with more than five employees, it was mandatory to be registered by the NSSF and comply. In the new act, any employer who employs one or more uh, employees, then you are required to be uh, to also comply and to be registered. So to give you a typical example, um, what it means is that if you are earning, say for example, uh, let me just give you how it works. So the contribution rates have been split into tier one and tier two. Tier one contribution is a must that they have to go to NSSF. So in the structure, it's 6% of minimum wage, which this act has been defined as 6,000. I know the minimum wage as per our uh, gazetted rates is about 12,000, but for the sake, for the purpose of this particular act, the minimum wage is 6,000 provided in the act. So in this case, you are taking 6% of 6,000, which gives you 360 shillings employee and then 360 shillings employer. And that gets to be a total of 720. And this particular tier one contribution is a must you have to contribute to NSSF as per that particular act of the NSSF Act 2013. Tier two contributions, um, it's been capped at the up earning in year one of 18,000. So how we arrive at 12,000 is you take the first 6,000 minus 18,000, you get 12,000. So the lower earning limit was uh, 6,000 here. And then the up earning limit is um, 18,000 as per the act. So the differential is 12,000. And this 12,000 is now what we are using to apply 6% employee, 6% employer, to give you a total of 720 shillings and 720 employee, employer, and a total of 1440. I want to make mention that for tier two, the act has allowed that you can contribute to any of your private sector pension scheme approved by the RPS subject to uh, obtaining call an approval to opt out of the NSSF Act. So let's do some examples. I know doing mathematics in the evening after lunch can be, and some of you may have taken lunch fish at Kosewe or some place. <laughs> so uh, Mark was in, quite often favorite in the afternoon classes, but I hope you'll be able to get this. So we are saying that, um, let's take, you have um, your salary at 15,000. Tier one contribution, you are applying 6% of 6,000. That is 360 shillings, 360 shillings, employer, employer, giving you a total of 720. There are two contributions. We will take the first expenditure we have put on 6,000. We less 15,000, you get 9,000. That becomes your upper earning for now in tier two. You apply 6,000, 6% 6 on 9,000, you get 540 employee, 540 employer. And that gives you a total employee of 900 shillings employee and 900 shillings employer. So in this illustration, there are two contributions you are allowed not to send to NSSF. You can contribute to any of your uh, 
employ a private sector pension arrangement, which in this case can be an, a pension scheme that has been established by your employer or a pension scheme that has been set up by any private provider by way of umbrella or individual pension scheme registered by the Retirement Benefits Authority. Now, let's do another example of someone who is earning 50,000. In this example, tier one distributions is a must you send to RBA 6% of 6,000, which is your lower earning. In this case, you still have 360 employee, 360 employer, giving you a total of 720. So the actual increase in this change is basically, before we were doing 200 shillings, but in this case, it's going up by 160 to 360 shillings uh, for both employer and employer. And therefore, the actual increase is then, um, uh, is, is from 200 shillings to 360 for tier one. Uh, from 200 to 360. The up earning limit, this is again same because the employee contribution is, is salary is more than 18,000. We cut the percentage to 18,000. So in this case, you are going to apply 6% uh, to 18,000 uh, for the purpose of tier two contribution, giving you a total of 720 employee employer. Tier two contributions are the ones that are allowed that you don't have to send to NSSF, you can send to any other private pension plan. I also need to let us know that annually, um, the upper, lower earning and upper earning are going to increase. And so in year one, the lower earning is 6,000, upper earning is 18. In year two, the lower earning will be 7,000, the upper earning is 36. In year three, the lower earning is 8,000, the upper earning is 72, and it goes on like that, as you can see on that table, up to year four, which will be the lower earning is 9,000, the upper earning is 108,000. The consequence of these earnings, it means the expected contributions will keep increasing for both year one and year two. From year five, uh, the rates will be gazetted by the uh, cabinet secretary. To contextualize the impact of this change, uh, just to give you an illustration, as you can see on the table, on the chart, is that for year one, your contribution will be a, um, for someone whose upper earning salary is say 20,000, their contribution will be capped at 2160. But when you come to year two, um, the contribution, let's take someone who is earning maybe 100,000 for that matter. Uh, if you look at the consolidated, one is 720, you will split between employer and employer, and then year two will be 1440, uh, capped at 2160. When you come to year two, that tier one goes moves from 720 to 840, and the capping is at 4320. You come to year three, uh, because of the increase in the upper earning limit you get, tier one is 960, and tier two will be 7680, uh, totaling to 8640. And then again, for Therefore, their contributions are going also to uh, increase like about 12,000. And by year five, uh, the contribution rates will have gone much higher. So I think, um, let me just say that um, the implications of organizations opting out of tier two contributions, it's subject to RB approval but it will require you to work with your employer and also the board of trustees and your pension administrator to help you to opt out of uh, work for opting out of tier two contributions. Uh, according to this particular act, the act has said that is an offense not to register 
and comply with the NSF Act, and is a condition for accessing uh, public service. And so maybe you want to get KRA returns or you want to process a passport. Uh, government is saying they are going to require you to comply with this particular act as part of a condition, a precondition for accessing um, government service. So the impact of this particular act then is that um, organizations then like especially HR, they have to review their budgets to be able to check, um, to make provisions for tier two and tier one contribution increase. And then also you have to walk through to opt out of tier two contributions. If you don't want to remit tier two contributions to NSSF, and you can contribute to a registered umbrella pension scheme or an occupational pension scheme, which has been put up in place by your employer or an individual pension scheme approved by the Retirement Benefits Authority. There'll be requirement to, for amendment of rules to be able to ensure our compliance. Obviously, uh, for those who have gratuity or pension provisions in your letters of uh, employment, even CBS, then this is also likely to have an effect. Take for example, you have a CBA in place with your union, a collective bargain agreement, and with a gratuity accrual rate maybe of 31%, and you have an extra cost of 6% employee to bear with. Uh, in these tough economic times, it can be very difficult so then it will require of you to engage with your employer and employee, uh, employers and employee to come together to see how these uh, renegotiations and review of contractual terms and how to see a win-win situation on accommodating the NSF Act. Also, uh, communication is key to the members uh, in terms of what is the consequence, members of staff, what are the consequences of NSF Act um, 2013 by way of its implementation. Um, the Board of Trustees, there is now a requirement to amend uh, technology systems to be able to have tier two contributions reflected in the NSSF, uh, reflect, reflected in the pension scheme and also compliance requirements that have been made provided in the NSF Act 2013 that pension scheme trustees will have to comply with. One such requirement is that tier two contributions which have been provided for in the pension scheme, um, you will not be able to access it um, until retirement. This again will also have an impact in terms of long-term investment strategy so there will be necessity to review investment policies uh, to uh, match the long-term view of the contributions that are coming in in the pension sector. Reporting will also have to change both by way of member statements and also RBA by way of compliance and also trustees. So reporting will change as well as communication employers and members of pension schemes. Administratively, um, there will be requirement to upgrade payroll systems and pension administration systems, which then are able to separate tier two and tier one contributions uh, so that that segregation should be able to be aligned with the NSF Act 2013 requirements. Tier two and tier one, uh, the act under section 66 have made provision that you those contributions are fully exempt from tax. And so at the point of access and payment, they are not required to be taxed at all at all. How can we opt out for an institute, a pension scheme to opt out of uh, getting their employer to remit tier two contributions to the NSSF, they have to be registered with RBA and KRA. And the administrator of that scheme has to have capacity to maintain records 
um, that separate tier one, tier two, and then the excess of contribution, which you call uh, tier three uh, separately. Also, um, by way of benefit payout, the rules of the scheme have to provide that you can only access tier two in the form of income drawdown or pension. And also then there would be requirement to comply with the RBA Act as regards to investment and the scheme complies with any prescribed requirement by the authority, including the transfer of benefits to other contracted out schemes or to the NSSF. For the Board of Trust, for an employer to opt out of their contributions, um, they will need to sign a board of directors resolution, which will indicate uh, effective date of contracting out of tier two, uh, category of employees affected, changes in contributions, if any, and changes in benefit structure, if any. Trustees of that pension scheme will also require to have a resolution uh, that will be accepting their contributions into the occupational pension plan. The employer will also do an undertaking to commit that they will meet the obligations on min minimum contribution as per the NSSF Act to the NSSF on tier one. The administrator of your pension scheme will also, on the other hand, do an undertaking that they will comply with the provisions of the NSSF Act. These documents are filed together with the notice of the employer, the RBA, on the intention to opt out, and the process takes not less than 60 days. Once the RBA have given an approval for opting out of remitting tier two contributions to NSSF, the employer now can actually remit those contributions to their private pension arrangement. Just to help you understand a little bit further is that, um, for example, if your contribution rate is 10% and you are remitting uh, your salary was 100,000, employee contribution, say 10% of the salary, your contribution will be 10,000 per month. If you get the approval for opt-out, you are then, um, you are then, your statement is likely now to look like this. You will have a split where um, initially you are having 10,000 being credited to the pension scheme, but then in this case, you'll have year two being allocated at 720 shillings in this year one, uh, a credit under employee, and then the excess, it means you'll have it as tier three, which is basically uh, implying that it is possible for the employers to still account tier two contributions, uh, including within the current contributions that they are making to their private sector pension schemes. Uh, this is good because then you don't have to increase your payroll cost uh, as a result of uh, the 6% provision um, in the, uh, as a result of this particular NSSF Act. I, think I just give you this example. So your statement is likely to change so that you have tier two, tier three, employee, employer split between exempt, non-exempt. This is just for the purpose of tax accounting. And then also employer account will have a split between tier two and tier, tier three as well. Now, um, also if you are running what you call a defined uh, benefit scheme, there will be a requirement uh, to meet certain minimum requirements uh, for the RBA. And um, this will require what you call a certification of what you call a reference test, uh, which will be given by the scheme approved actuary. RBA will issue within 30 days after you have applied to opt out as an organization, uh, within 30 days, if it's satisfied, they will grant approval for contracting out and issue a certificate 
um, so that you can now begin to remit tier two contributions instead of sending them to NSSF, you, you sent them to your own approved pension scheme. Now, before then, it means employers still have to remit tier one and tier two contributions to the NSSF. Um, but after you have uh, opted out, the, it, the Act has provided that you can request NSSF to now transfer your tier two contributions uh, on the merit of your RBI approval to transfer that those contributions to your own individual pension scheme. But why opt out? I think uh, statistics in the industry private sector pension schemes, umbrella occupational, the investment income on average is about nine to 10% net. Um, from the few analysis I've seen on the published audited accounts by NSSF, I think um, you get an average of about 6% over the years. The expense ratio in private sector pension schemes is lower compared to NSSF. Transparency, I think private sector, you are able to get your statements. I'm sure also NSF, they do give the statements, but private sector, I find it's easy to get your statements very easily. Um, and you get that through online portal, uh, annually after audit, you can get your e-statements or you can just make an inquiry anytime. It's not a big problem for most private pension schemes. Also on death benefit processing is easy. When you leave private sector, you are paid within 30 days. Uh, some schemes like NWELT, we do pay within two weeks, you have your money in the account. Um, our return for some of our umbrella books, we have done an, an average of around 11 to 12% uh, investment return for our umbrella and individual pension plans. And these are some of the benefits of opting out. But you have the right to remit all your tier one and tier two to NSSF. The law allows you that, or to opt out of tier two and contribute to any of your personal or umbrella or occupational pension plan in place. Subject to the fact that it has to be approved by RBA for what you call a contracting out. What are the benefits that we expect out of this? Then number one is that uh, retirement benefits, which will be paid at retirement by NSSF, and they are not to be taxed at all at all. And they can only be accessed at retirement. Unlike in occupational, the tier three, which you have been getting uh, before age 60 or age 50, you get on early exit, you get up to 50% of them, both employer and employer portion. This particular tier two pension provisions in the act, they are taken as what you call protected rights. You cannot access that money until uh, retirement. And they can only be paid by way of pension. Immigration, that is when you leave the country um, on permanent migration, uh, migration basis. Uh, but you have to show evidence that you have a permanent residency in an another place. Of course, if you go to places like Mikiko, where we once in a while we are not so sure where it lies, uh, chances are that we may not uh, pay on that basis. Invalidity, which is permanent and uh, disability, then that is paid. Uh, funeral grant and also survivors, which is basically a uh, benefit to your nominated beneficiaries. Under the Retirement Benefits Act, uh, Regulation 26, the provision is that um, accrued pension savings do not form part of the estate of a member. And so trustees are guided by your nominated beneficiaries, which you apportion the percentage uh, of benefit entitlement as long as it tallies to 100%. Uh, so that is becomes like your will for the purpose of payment of benefits uh, for pension. Where there are minors, the trend is that those benefits can be put into a trust uh, for the purpose of upkeep and education for your children. When they, <coughs> they are of maturity, you are able then to um, uh, wind up the trust. And we do have trust, by the way, as annual uh, to be able now to 
pay to them in any residual balance that is left. Um, in the next few minutes, allow me to just talk to us about a few tips on personal finance, and then we will be ending. Um, for you to have money, I think, unlike most people, they begin with how. Today, I want to request that, how about you answer to the question, why should money look for you rather than why should, how should you look for money? So the starting point is why, why should you look, why should money look for you rather than uh, how would you want to be rich? <laughs> Most people are focusing, how can I be, become rich? But I think why um, is a much bigger question that I would encourage us to reflect on. Once you have answered to your question, why, go to the next one, how. How therefore can I answer to um, my why? So why is your money vision? How is your money mission? And then within what value system are you going to achieve that, uh, those goals? But then a vision without accountability is not self. So have some accountability infrastructure around you. And then in a VUCA world we are in, volatility is high, play adaptability. So you look at the opportunities in the moment, so you adapt to those opportunities. Some could be risks, below the risks are opportunities. So you discern and take um, take opportunity of the opportunities in the moment. But ignorance is very expensive. So consistently budget to have knowledge capital on your financial planning. The quality of decisions you make is influenced by the level of knowledge you have around your financial planning. Then have a personal risk management framework and then an execution strategy on, uh, on your personal financial planning. So for you to sustainably grow your wealth, I encourage that first is that you need to have ability to attract money. So there are three levels. You are either attracting money by way of your skill and experience and competency, career and credibility, or you are attracting it as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, or even both. I would request we mute, sorry. After money has come, you are the first threat to that money <laughs> through your behavior. So you are spending behavior would influence whether you retain or you, you spend it. After you have preserved it, you need knowledge to grow it. And that has to do with knowledge of how to invest, to grow, so that uh, out of what you have, you are able to grow through savings and investment. If you do that, you are likely to have conviction to your why, aligned to your commitment, you play consistency, and that's how wealth sustainably is created. Balance your assets and liabilities. And it's important to know what makes to be your assets. Assets are anything that bring cash to your pocket. Liabilities are things that take money from your pocket. Encourage look like you, you there are many people who are carrying many burdens in their life. And those sucks. I think you mute, sorry. I would encourage uh, when we work out, look at some of the financial burdens you have and it could be debt, your debt levels or levels of dependence is very high. We encourage that you reevaluate the burdens that you have so that you can manage that carefully. And then Madeni, I saw this funny picture someplace, Lisa Ujenga Mwili. Uh, I know this too much it has pushed many people to the level of um, lack of sustainability in the area of financial planning. 
I think I just want to stop it there. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, my colleagues on call, it's four o'clock and uh, we have to take questions. Sorry, um, I think uh, for the time we have had, we, we can do much more during the questions and answers. I just wanted to be brief. Thank you so much and uh, let, let's open it up for questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Wafubua, for that uh, presentation. Members, we've now moved to the question and answer sessions. Uh, we welcome your questions to come into the chat box so that we can have uh, the speaker responding uh, to your questions. I'll start off with the first question that has come into, into the chat box. And uh, Mr. Wafubua, this is to you. What are the major implications of this new act to SMEs? What are um, Brian, allow me to ask uh, my colleague Albanas. I can see his own. That is, <laughs> so that is okay. And, and Albanas, when you, you can just put on your, if it's okay with you, you can uh, take the question. Albanas, hope you are able to, to get the question. What are the major implications of the new act to SMEs? Um. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I will attempt to respond on uh, the implication this particular act has on NS, uh, SMEs. Uh, in this particular case, you're noting the requirements as provided within the National Social Security Act of 2013, is that if you have one or more employees, then you must participate in terms of contribution. Uh, this is 6% of uh, the employee pensionable pay and the employer as well matching uh, similar contributions. And uh, therefore, is uh, I know most of the SMEs already had a very tight budget, uh, and especially on employee, um, uh, um, especially on contributions to retirement benefit schemes. Uh, if you look at the current structures, is majority of SMEs uh, do not have um, a pension scheme which is sponsored by the employer, and uh, therefore this is actually coming with an additional financial burden uh, on uh, those particular SMEs. Uh, because in this particular case, it means is either they uh, they contribute to NSSF at the rate of 6%. Uh, I, I know for some of them, the route that they are going to take is um, to be able to um, reduce their staff so that then they are able to accommodate that particular expenditure uh, to be able to participate in, SN, uh, in NSSF. And uh, therefore, yes, it is a good thing in terms of... Um, uh, for the employees to be able to retire with some dignity. Uh, however, on that particular liability is coming with uh, on additional financial burden to SMEs is uh, what majority of them will be able to struggle with. Uh, some of them may have then to be able to restructure the employment contracts uh, in a way that then uh, they have to let go of some of their staff. And that, as well, that has an impact as well in, uh, in the sector. So that is a key one that we uh, we foresee on uh, SMEs in terms of compliance. Uh, again, look at the uh, penalties coming through on uh, uh, either late or failure to remit uh, contributions to NSSF. And again, it's, it's 5% of this amount. And it's again a huge burden on employers uh, who are currently struggling to be able to generate enough income. And now they have to contribute an additional money to NSSF, uh, failure to which then you also incur some penalties. Uh, to it. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, elaborate response, uh, Mr. Albanas. I'll move to the next question. Uh, will Tier 2 contributions opted out of NSSF be taxed, unlike those at NSSF that are not taxed? Uh, All right. So, as I mentioned, okay, Albanas, go ahead. Just go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so as uh, our MP had mentioned, is that uh, the provisions of the Act is that uh, any contributions being made to National Social Security Fund, this is both the Tier 1 contribution and Tier 2 contributions are not going to be subjected to any form of tax. And uh, therefore, at the payroll level, is uh, those particular contributions have to be given the first priority on tax exemption uh, to NSSF as tier one, and uh, the money that is being contracted out or opted out to a contractor or scheme uh, as tier two contribution as well is not going to be subjected to any form of tax at the payroll. Uh, similarly, is uh, the investment income uh, from those particular contribution as well will not be subjected to tax. 
And uh, when this particular member is accessing the money at the point of retirement, as well, there will be an exemptions on uh, the both tier one and tier two contributions, unless there is a change um, within the income tax act to be able to subject those contributions to tax. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on to the next question. What happens to employers who have employees earning less than 6,000 shillings? Okay. Uh, so uh, in this particular case, you're looking at uh, the, the act currently provides that uh, the 6% applies on pensionable earnings. Uh, in this case, if you have an employee whose pay is, uh, is actually less than the lower earning limit of 6,000, then you apply 6% on that particular amount. Uh, if you have a salary of 4,000, then it will be 4,000 times 6%. Uh, the only difference is that uh, those particular employees will not be able to participate under what you are calling tier two contributions. So all their money, uh, uh, both the employee and the employer is going to be classified as tier one contributions, which then will be remitted to NSSF. Uh, very well put. Uh, on to the next question. In which way does uh, the new act affect domestic employees? Um, thank you so much. I, I know there is a legal aspect to it. Um, uh, with your permission, I can ask uh, our legal officer or our that is okay. to just that is okay. Yeah. I like on that. Thank you. Sorry, thank you. Thank you, Albanus. And uh, in terms of how the act will affect domestic employees, is uh, the law provides that. Uh, as an employer, whether you have one or more empl employees, mm -hmm. then you're supposed to make provision for NSSF for these employees. So domestic workers are paid on an on a monthly on a monthly basis, hence they are eligible to be provided for in terms of NSSF. Um, I know most of uh, the employers don't uh, make NSSF contributions for their domestic uh, employees. But in this case, then you're required to do so. I've also seen a question on what happens for employees who are or for the casual laborers. So for this uh, segment of employees would be exempted from paying NSSF considering that they are earning uh, their salary or their wages on a daily basis. But, but for those that earn uh, monthly salaries, then uh, we have no option as employers to make provision for NSSF. Thank you very Thank much you. for that. Yeah, I think you've been able to answer two questions uh, at one go. Uh, on to the next question. What are the benefits in terms of relief for employees who pay NSSF Tier 1, Tier 2, and voluntary contributions? Um, uh, sorry, I, I missed the question. If you could uh, kindly repeat. Yes, I will repeat. Uh, what are the benefits in terms of relief for employees who pay NS for, for NSSF Tier 1, Tier 2, and uh, the voluntary contributions? Okay. Um, uh, so thank you. Uh, uh, to respond in terms of uh, the relief that you're going to get as an employee um, on uh, the Tier 1, Tier 2, and also for those who are making voluntary. So in this case, we did uh, mention about uh, the tax benefits that you're going to get. And this is actually going to apply on uh, both tier one, tier two, and any voluntary contributions that you're making towards the National Social Security Fund. Uh, and uh, in this case, is um, uh, the amount that you contribute um, would not be subjected to any form of taxation as it goes to NSSF. Uh, if you are participating in a, in a scheme uh, established by the employer as well, you are going to be able to apply that particular exemption on payroll and also the uh, relief on the investment income and a relief on the benefits that is going to be paid out to you. Uh, to speak on uh, the benefits as well, uh, if then the money is actually coming within the scheme that uh, has been established by your employer, uh, I think it's more on uh, the... Uh, investment income that you're going to generate, which is more superior compared to what will be remitted to the National Social Security Fund, and also uh, transparency in the manner that the benefits are actually going to be administered. Uh, so currently, I think uh, from the legal framework, the only relief you're going to get is more on uh, first growing your retirement pot. Uh, you can actually be able to note that uh, with the, if we hold the contributions, the maximum 2,160, by the time you're hitting retirement age at the age of 60, majority of us will have more than a million shillings in terms of their retirement savings. 
uh, that money will be paid to you without any tax. Uh, continue with the 400, that will be around 300,000 Kenya shillings. And therefore, it's a benefit in terms of increasing these contributions uh, towards the National Social Security Fund. Thank you. Thank you uh, for, for that response. Uh, on to the next question. Uh, what is the procedure of accessing voluntary contributions made over and above tier one and tier two contributions? Okay. Um, thank you so much. Uh, just to seek clarity is that uh, these voluntary contributions, uh, the excess is the amount that is actually being remitted to the scheme that has been established by the employer. Uh, if that is the case, uh, we're looking at those particular uh, benefits, then can only be accessed in line with the provisions of the trusted and role of uh, the, that particular occupational retirement benefit scheme uh, set up by your employer. Uh, should you wish to make voluntary contributions to uh, towards National Social Security Fund, it will mean then in terms of access that money, uh, yes, it is payable to you as a cash lump sum. Uh, however, you can only get that money from the age of 50 years. Thank you. Thank you for that response. Uh, on to the next question. Uh, in reference to the presentation, the years, year one, year two, uh, does this refer to the year the act uh, comes into effect or the year when an employer is established, uh, thinking in terms of an early established employer? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, in this particular case, the year that is ma being made reference to is uh, the year 2023. This is a year when this particular act um, is actually now being implemented. Uh, and therefore, as per the communications made by the National Social Security Fund, then we are picking 2023 when the act is being implemented as the first year. Uh, the second year then applies uh, from 2024 going forward. Okay, okay, that is noted. Uh, uh, on to the, the, the next question. Uh, in a private school setup, uh, revenue is generated uh, from school fees paid by the students per month, uh, only when the school is open. And then uh, the teachers are not paid over the holidays, uh, but the watchmen and the gardeners are paid uh, throughout the year. Uh, how will NSSF remittances be made? Albanas, I don't know if you're able to capture that. Okay, um, I can ask uh, my colleagues on board to help with that, responding to that. That is okay. Uh, either Papa or Simon, thank you. I can repeat the question. Oh, In a private oh, school setup, oh. revenue is generated from yeah revenue is generated from school fees paid by students per month, only when the school is open. Uh, then the teachers are not paid over the holidays, but the watchmen and gardeners are paid throughout the year. How will NSSF remittances be made? So maybe I can just uh, take that. Uh, my is that the Act has provided 6% of the earnings. So if in that period there wasn't any earning, so nothing is remitted. But if there was salary coming, then it's expected. As long as you're doing uh, remuneration at payroll, then the 6% will apply. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for, for, for the responses, Mr. Fu Wapubua and also the team at NWEL. Uh, we really appreciate uh, the responses to the questions uh, that have, have come. I've, I've seen there's one more that has come in. Uh, how is tier two treated prior to opting out and subsequent to opting out upon approval? So tier two, you before opting out, you sent to NSSF, guided by the act. After opting out, you account for it separately within the pension scheme that you have. Uh, so it has to be segregated from the normal contributions you've been making. In the event you are audited for compliance by NSSF, then you are able to demonstrate that tier two is under the act is defined as protected rights. It can only be accessed at retirement and in form of pension and fully tax exempt. 
So the contributions you will have sent tier two to NSSF, the law has allowed, you can request for a transfer from NSSF. Maybe you have done for two months or three months, they transfer to your uh, occupational umbrella pension arrangement. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Wafubwa, uh, for 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 that response, and also to the to the team at Enwealth. We really appreciated your responses to the questions, and also uh, the presentation uh, by uh, Mr. Wafubwa. We've come to the end of the question and answer session, but before we wrap up the webinar, I will invite the head of branches and Kim Som at Kim uh, to give us the closing remarks uh, as yeah. as we go into that. Can you yeah, proceed with our Brian, Yes. Yeah, maybe Brian, just to let you know, that, uh, those who would want to access uh, more information or they want a meeting, which we don't charge uh, from our end, we are happy to schedule the meeting. I just want to post on the, on the, uh, I want just to share my, our contact details and we are able to, employers who may want to have join an umbrella we have an umbrella we can help them to contract out tier two contribution to our umbrella solution for those who have a pension scheme and they want to contract out of nsf we have a team of legal team within the organization we can help them to opt out to contract out uh, you want to review your legal documents trustee and rules uh, to comply with these provisions. Again, we are helpful. You want to do member education, again, on matters, retirement, personal finance, uh, we are available. And our contacts are on the screen. Um, again, we'll be happy to reach out and uh, support you. My email address, I will cut you, I'll just send it on the chat, swafuba at enwealth.co.ae. Uh, which is um, my email address, and you can also be able to drop an email. I uh, will be able to support you in that process. Thank you so much. Again, we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wafubu. I'm seeing there's a hand that has been raised by Susan Osioka, uh, who wants to, uh, ch to chime into the, you know, to, to chip into the discussion and give us clarification. Uh, Susan Musioka. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, thank you so much. Um, there was a small clarification I needed to make on the casual workers. I work for NSSF. Uh, my colleague Francis Okinda is also on call. Um, the casual workers, um, this new act, what, what it does is that it also brings into, into the whole story, the casual workers who in the previous act, there was a, contribution that was being made made called special contributions, which was not, uh, which was not uh, of benefit to the casual workers. So in this new act, um, casual workers are not exempted. The casual worker, the em employees who are exempted, are people who are employed under the international convention and uh, persons who are normally not resident in Kenya, but who are here for less than three years, so casual workers, what happens is that whatever contribution comes within a month, that is what is calculated uh, the, the 6%. So that even as they work over a long period of time, they do have social security in the long run. In the previous act, they were missing out. They'd work for years on end and they'd not have social security, which was not very fair for them. So that's the clarification we needed to give just so that in case the employers here they're able to also bring in, bring on board the casual workers for them to benefit from social security. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Susan. Uh, we have received the clarification and we are well informed. Thank you very much. At this point, I will uh, allow uh, on the invite uh, the head of branches and Kim Som at uh, the Kenya Institute of Management, uh, Ms. Mildred Matibe, to give us the closing remarks. Karibu Mildred. And thank you very much, Brian. Uh, before I go to that session, Susan, 
as uh, there's uh, someone who asked for your number if you're kind enough you can uh, if you don't mind you can post in the chat if it is okay with you other than that um i wish to thank all of you members for joining us in this session um first of all i wish to thank um, the membership team under the leadership of brian who organized this session and Brian for emceeing the session, thank you very much. For the ICT technical team, uh, thank you for your support. Um, at this point, I also want to thank members who have attended uh, and engaged us in this session. I know uh, issues to do with um, financial security, especially in the old age is very close to all of our hearts. So. Uh, thank you all for attending, and um, I want to encourage you, we have more of these sessions under different formats, be it trainings, uh, be it classrooms engagement, we have all, I think we, I had mentioned the same in our, in, at the beginning, so feel free to engage with KIM in all manner of our forums. So this is how informative and this is how exciting they usually are. To the MWEF team, thank you for supporting us in this webinar. Thank you for answering for those who came uh, in to answer the session uh, and support the speaker. Thank you very much. And to the speaker, uh, Mr. Simon Wakubwa, uh, I cannot thank you enough. This is a very, uh, this is very engaging. This is very informative and um, Let's not stop there. Uh, we wish, uh, I want to believe we will have more engagements so that we all uh, continue learning. And as KIM, we believe in learning and sharing. So thank you for joining us in ensuring that we are all learning and sharing. So on that note, I wish you a very good evening, a very lovely evening. So let's continue learning and sharing and uh, Thank you and goodbye, Santini. Bye.